I don't usually make reaction videos, so this will be my first, but recently someone sent me a link to a video um, asking me if I can give my thoughts and my, my reaction to it. Um, it's about a man who converted to Islam. His name is Tony. So when I clicked the link and read the title and skimmed through the video uh, quickly, I thought to myself, well, maybe it would be helpful and insightful to some out there, um, you know, to give my thoughts and reaction on some of the issues Tony brings up about why he converted to Islam. And that's one of the reasons why I'm responding to this video, uh, because it has a lot of the, you know, typical uninformed, ignorant Islamic argumentations, which I'm going to address according to scripture. Um, and I don't say that out of disrespect. I believe that the more we challenge each other respectfully and truthfully and speak on real and even personal matters without, you know, being offensive to one another, you know, we can get, we can come to common grounds, uh, or at least understand each other more, um, you know, despite our different beliefs, uh, you know, we could have normal conversations. Um, I don't know anything about uh, Tony, I don't know him personally, so my aim in this video is to strictly, um, you know, address his arguments presented in his video um, and, you know, correct some misunderstandings uh, that he or, you know, uh, anyone else might have about Christianity. And if this video goes well, I might make, you know, more of these videos, uh, make it a series kind of thing, react to more similar, other similar uh, videos like this. Okay, so let's watch the video. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Tony. I was born into a Christian family and many of my family members are ministers or pastors or involved with the church in some way. Although my country is very beautiful, there's also a lot of problems with it. For example, crime. A woman is raped every two minutes according to statistics. Every two minutes a woman would be raped. Now the okay. Um, let me just pause the video for a second. Uh, so he, he, he made three statements. Uh, he said he was born and raised in a Christian family or household. Um, okay, first of all, my, my thoughts, my, my response is going to be very short. I'm not going to get into detail for the sake of time. This video alone is 11 minutes, so I'm going to try to get, get my thoughts out as fast as I can. Uh, not everyone who professes to be Christian is Christian. Um, what I mean is, in John chapter 3, Jesus said you must be born again. This is a supernatural work of God. Spiritual conversion, inward conversion that happens through the washing and regener regeneration of the Holy Spirit. So someone can verbally say they're Christian, but um, they might not be saved. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 15, uh, verse 8, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Um, also, the fact that he said he came from a Christian background and now he's no longer Christian. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, we read, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy from the Holy One, and you know all things. There is no such thing as a ex Christian. Either you're saved uh, by the power of God, by the grace of God, and you endure, or you were never saved to begin with. You're never Christian. <clears throat> Second point he brought he brought up was uh, that his country uh, there's a lot of bad things that happen in his country. I don't know where he lives. He might live in the states. He might live in Canada. But North America as a whole, the states and Canada, are not Christian countries. Um, what I mean is, when it comes to their philosophies and ideologies, they're far from what the Bible teaches. Uh, for example, this world uh, focuses on materialism and wealth. The Bible focuses on spiritual things. Um, Christ said in Matthew 6, uh, Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal 
For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Uh, in First John chapter 2, once again, we read, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world is okay with, uh, you know, greed and selfishness and wealth and homosexuality and abortion, uh, which is all contrary to what the Bible teaches, um, as well as the world teaches that faith brings happiness. But the Bible says faith, true faith, brings persecution and suffering. Um, the third point he made was that rape... Uh, statistics are high in this country i don't know what his point was if he's trying to relate that to christianity um and that's the thing about so far what i've noticed in this video is he doesn't conclude his points he doesn't he just moves on to the next point he doesn't clarify or elaborate what he means by that point right there that rape is an issue in this country or what does that have to do with christianity did christ command christians to go rape people the Bible tells us to abstain from sexual immorality um, and lust and all these sinful things. Um, let's continue the video. Now the Christians in the churches would teach the people that the shaitan created the religion of Islam and that it was an evil religion. The media and everybody seemed to hate the Muslims. And this idea was propagated through our society. But I did not hate the Muslims. I wanted to guide the Muslims to the straight path and show them that they should not worship any rock or any man or any created thing. Now, could you imagine me telling a Muslim that? Okay. Uh, so he, he said that Christians say Islam is of the devil. Um, the reason we say that is in First John chapter 2 again, uh, starting from verse 22, we read, who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Islam denies the Father and the Son. The Quran says Allah has no Son. On the Kaaba, it says far be removed that Allah should have a Son. Uh, he is the Antichrist. He who says that God has no son. Um, as well as in Galatians chapter 1, we read in verse 6, starting from verse 6, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Uh, Islam comes with a different gospel. Another point he made was that he used to tell Muslims not to worship a rock or any created thing. The thing about the Kaaba is it predates Islam. Pagans used to bring their rocks and their 360 idols and walk around the Kaaba before Islam began. Um, in Sahih Bukhari, uh, we read this, we read, narrated Abdullah bin Masood, the Prophet entered Mecca, and at that time, there were 360 idols around the Kaaba. He started stabbing the idols with a stick he had in his hand and reciting truth, Islam, has come and falsehood, disbelief, has vanished. Um, pagans worshipped rocks and stones. Today, we see Muslims face towards a rock every time they pray. They face towards the black stone five times a day and bow down towards it. People travel land and sea just to go and kiss this black stone. Things pagans used to do. Um, and there's no reference anywhere in history of Abraham building the Kaaba in Mecca. Um, so that, that, that's the issue with, uh, with the Kaaba. Let's continue the video. At this time, I didn't really understand my religion very well, so I wanted to study it. And I was raised to believe in the Trinity, and so I worshipped the Trinity out of ignorance. This is the way my parents taught me to do. Okay. <laughs> Did he just say he used to worship the Trinity? 
no Christian talks like this. Christians don't say we worship the Trinity. The Trinity is an explanation of God's nature and being. Um, I don't think this guy was ever a Christian. I mean, his concept is off. But let's let's continue watching. See, I was born into the strongest sect of Christianity in my country. These are known as the Baptists. And they believe in the Trinity very strongly. But for some reason, it just didn't feel good for me to do this. But I just followed along because this is what I was taught to do. So I began to read the Bible, and I wanted to learn my religion so I could teach it to others and teach it to the Muslims. But when I read the Bible, I was shocked. I couldn't believe what is in the Bible. I was surprised that every prophet came with the same message, that there is no God except for the one true God, and that you should worship him alone. None of the prophets taught about a trinity, not even a single one. They all came. Okay. Let, let me let me take a few moments to reference uh, just a few of the prophets who spoke about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah, who is a prophet in the Old Testament, we read that God refers to himself as the Father. In the book of Malachi, who is another prophet, which is also in the Old Testament, we see God referring to himself as the Father. Once again, then we have King David in the first book of Chronicles, who writes, uh, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Uh, so we definitely don't, we definitely see God the Father in the Old Testament. And so far, I think we can all agree that the Father is God. But we have Isaiah, who is another prophet in the Old Testament, who writes this 700 years before uh, Christ was born for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace here isaiah refers to the son as el gibor which means mighty god in hebrew uh two chapters earlier in chapter seven uh, isaiah writes Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel in Hebrew means God with us. Uh, we have Solomon, who is another prophet in the Old Testament, who, who writes a prophetic passage in Proverbs, uh, where he references one who ascends and descends from heaven. One who uh, controls the wind and the waters with his fist. Uh, one who made the earth and established everything. And then Solomon concludes by asking if we know his name and his son's name. King David in the Old Testament writes, By the word of the Lord, um, everything was made. Then when we go to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, John makes it clear John, which is in the New Testament, he makes it clear that this word who is God is Christ, who made everything that exists and who is the creator. In the book of Zechariah, who is also another prophet in the Old Testament, God says uh, in Zechariah chapter 12, God says, they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. This is God foreshadowing and referencing the crucifixion of the Messiah, where God is saying, they will look on me, whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him uh, as one mourns for his only son. God the Father wasn't crucified. God the Father wasn't pierced. The Son was crucified and pierced on the cross. Uh, yet this shows how the Son and the Father are one. Just as John said, the Father and the Son are one in John chapter 10. Actually, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Jeremiah uh, calls the branch, which is a title for the Messiah, um, the Lord our righteousness. He calls the Messiah the Lord our righteousness. Moses in the Torah starts the first chapter uh, of the first uh, book in the Torah by saying, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Elohim is plural, uh, which means God in Hebrew, and it's not singular showing a plurality um, uh, of God, who is one in nature. 
Now, interestingly, in, in, in the first chapter uh, of Genesis, the first verse, we see God the Father in, in verse 1. So God created the heavens and the earth. In verse 2, we see the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. In verse 3, we see the Word of God, um, God speaking creation into existence. And as we know, the Word of God is Christ. So we see the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit in the first three verses of Genesis. Uh, now these are just a few passages, there are countless passages of the Father uh, and the Son. But now let me get into uh, the Spirit of God, uh, passages that um, speak on the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. The prophet Job, who is Ayub in the Quran, writes about the Spirit of God. I'll put the reference up. Uh, Joel, who is another prophet in the, in the Bible, writes about the Spirit of God that one day the Holy Spirit will be poured out into the hearts of believers. Um, then we have Ezekiel and uh, Zechariah who write about the Holy Spirit as well. So God is one, yet in his complexity, there's unity. Um, we have no choice but to believe in the three persons of God, who is one, as we read in the Shema, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Um, so God is one. But within the Godhead, there's uh, three distinct persons. They all came with the message of oneness of God. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Exodus chapter 34, verse 14, For you shall worship no other God. Mark chapter 12 verse 29 and Jesus answered him the first of all the commandments is hear O Israel the Lord our God is one Lord Matthew chapter 4 verse 10 then said Jesus unto him go away Satan for it is written you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve I was also shocked to see the method. Okay, um, I like how he conveniently skips over all the passages that talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, that reference the Trinity. Uh, let, let's continue watching. Of prayer, of the, the way the prophets, the way they prayed. When I was young, I was taught to pray like this, with my hands together, looking up to the sky. This is the way I was taught to pray, you know, sitting on a chair, just putting your hands together like this. This is the way I was taught to pray. But when I was reading the Bible, I saw that the prophets, they fell on their face to pray in submission to God. For example, Genesis 17, verse 3. And Abraham fell on his face. Numbers, chapter 16, verse 4. And when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. First Samuel, chapter 20, verse 41. David arose out of a place toward the south and fell on his face to the ground. Second Chronicles, chapter 20, verse 18. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Okay, anytime I see Second Chronicles, <laughs> anytime I see a Muslim referencing or quoting from Second Chronicles, like, okay, clearly, I mean, I feel like they just went on, like, a website and, you know, looked up all, all these, like, passages in the Old Testament. I mean, Second Chronicles, seriously, um, it's not a common, you know, book to go to. But anyway, um, okay, Christ said, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they stand, you know, uh, in public to be seen by men. Jesus said, when you pray, go to your room, close the door, go into your closet, pray in secret that your Father in heaven uh, may reward you openly. Uh, God already knows. Jesus said the Father already knows what we ought to and should pray for. Uh, he already knows our heart. It's not about how you stand, how you sit. I mean, no Christian prays like this looking up. Anyway, no comment. Um, Jesus said, those who worship God worship, uh, must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Um, 
we're not to make a spectacle out of it, you know, stand on the street corners and be seen by men, or it's something we do privately. Matthew 26, verse 39, and he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed. Revelations 7, verse 11, and all the angels stood around about the throne and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. And I also read in the Bible about fasting. Matthew chapter 4 verse 2 And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterwards hungry. Mark 2 chapter 18 And the disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast. Matthew 6 verse 18 Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad continence, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Matthew 6, verse 17. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. So as a Christian, we weren't even taught that we should fast. This wasn't even something that the, the, the church leaders even taught us to do. And not only this, but in the Bible it talks about the Hajj. Okay, let me just pause the video right there. Um, all throughout scripture we see the principle of fasting. Jesus commanded us to fast. He said, when you fast, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites uh, who put on a sad countenance to be seen by men. Again, fasting, according to scripture, just like praying, is to be done in secret. Jesus said, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing, uh, so that God will see, you know, you fasting. Um, also, fasting in the Bible is not done out of compulsion or out of a ritualistic, you know, uh, means. Uh, again, we're not to make a spectacle out of it. If anything, with Muslims, the whole world knows when Ramadan is. Um, fasting, according to the scriptures, is uh, to put the deeds of the flesh to rest, to deny yourself and have fellowship with God the Father. Uh, but let's continue the video. In Psalms 84, verse 65, Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, who sets their heart on pilgrimage as they pass through the valley of Becca. Okay, what? <laughs> uh, I don't know if he's trying to rhyme Mecca with Becca, the Valley of Becca, because he, he's talking about uh, pilgrimage, um, Hajj. I have nothing to say, uh, no comment, because the Valley of Becca and Mecca, two geographical locations. Um, Genesis 47 verse 9. And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are a hundred and thirty years. You see, if the Christians were following their Bible, they would be so similar to the Muslims, and they would not hate the Muslims, but instead they turn their backs on their own book. They don't even believe in their own book. Instead they teach something different. If only the Christians would follow their own book, they would believe in the oneness of God. They would pray by prostrating. They would give charity. They would fast. And they would go to the Hajj. Inshallah. Now when okay. Again, praying, fasting, giving charity, all this is to be done in secret. That's what Christ, that's what God commands of us. Now when I read the Bible, I was also disgusted at what I found. I was horrified because of the lies in it. For example, in the Old Testament, there's a story about Jacob, how he has a wrestling match with God, and he beats up God, he wins, he is superior in strength to God. Now, how can I believe that? An another good example is in the... Okay, the story about Jacob, um, the God of the Quran and the God of the Bible are two different gods. Two, they have two different attributes. Um, God of the Bible, throughout the Bible, we see God revealing himself uh, to the prophets and to people. 
uh, through many different ways. Um, God can reveal himself in a vision. God can reveal himself in a dream. Uh, God revealed himself to Abraham in Genesis 18, where Abraham uh, saw God face to face in human form. Uh, God revealed to God revealed himself to Moses in the Old Testament. Uh, Isaiah saw the face of the Lord. Again, God reveals himself in many ways. One way he reveals himself is through bodily form. And when we go to the book of Colossians in the New Testament, it says this bodily form was Christ, the word of God. Um, God reveals himself. Allah, on the other hand, is distant. Now, the thing about wrestling with someone, you can't wrestle with someone at a distance. It's intimate. And that's what... That's who God is. He's intimate. He's personal. He revealed himself to Jacob face to face, wrestled with him, blessed him, changed his whole identity, his whole being. And that's what happens when you encounter God. Um, thing I want to say is uh, we, in our walks in Christ, I'm speaking to Christians, we need to wrestle in prayer. We need to wrestle in fasting. We need to wrestle in our walks in Christ. Uh, and struggle, and then we'll prevail, and God will bless us through, uh, you know, abiding in Christ. Um, there's a bigger picture to Jacob wrestling with God. It's in the Bible, it says that God sleeps. How could God sleep? Psalms 44, verse 23. Awake, why do you sleep, O Lord? Psalm 78, verse 65. Then the Lord awakened as one out of sleep. And like a mighty man that shouts by reason of wine. How dare anybody utter these lies against God? So how could I believe in the Trinity? Okay. I think he's taking those uh, psalms a bit too literally. Uh, they're metaphors. If we go to uh, Psalm, if we go to Psalm forty-four, uh, verse twenty-three, the one he quoted. Let's read it in context. Let's start from verse twenty, for example. Um, it says, if we had forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands to a foreign God, would not God search this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Yet for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Verse 23, awake, why do you sleep, O Lord? Arise, do not cast us off forever. Why do you hide your face um, and forget our affliction and our oppression? This is a metaphor not saying God is literally asleep, but that he's inattentive, that he's not responding, that he's silent. They're pleading with God and weeping, saying, help us. Um, you know, even though we're in sin and whatnot, help us. Uh, same thing with Psalm 78, um, verse 65, where it says, The Lord awoke as from sleep. So in Psalm 78, if we start reading from... Verse 56, I'll read it quickly so we understand the context. Because if this is such a big deal, and if this is one of the reasons why he left Christianity, one of the reasons, let's read it in context, see if this is literal or a metaphor. Psalm 78, starting from verse 56. Yet they tested and provoked the Most High God, and did not keep his testimonies, but turned back and acted unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow, for they provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their carved images. When God heard this, he was furious and greatly abhorred Israel. So Israel is in sin. God sees what's happening. He's not asleep. He sees it. So that he, fors he God, forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, uh, the tent he had placed among men, and delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. He also gave his people over to the sword. So God's doing something. He's giving his people over to the enemy uh, and was furious with his inheritance. Um, the, verse 63, the fire consumed their young men and their maidens were not given in marriage. Their priests fell by the sword and their widows made no lamentation. Then the Lord awoke as from sleep like a mighty man who shouts because of wine. And what did God do? So he responded now. What, he was silent, but now he responded. Verse 66, and he beat back his enemies and he put them to a perpetual reproach. Again, these uh, so these verses are me metaphors, figure of speeches. 
none of the prophets believed in the Trinity and none of the prophets taught about the Trinity. How could I believe in it? So I went to my family and I told them I do not believe in the Trinity because none of the prophets did. And so they arranged for me to meet with one of my one of my family members who is a minister. And I debated with him and I said, I want to see where in the Bible does it say there's a Trinity. There's nowhere in the Bible. It doesn't say that anywhere. And the proofs he gave were very, very weak. Okay. Despite all the verses and passages I, I read earlier about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there's an interesting passage in Isaiah 48, verse 16. One of my favorite pa uh, verses in the Bible. This is God speaking here in Isaiah 48, verse 16. God says, Come near to me, hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and His Spirit have sent me. So this is God talking, saying that He was there from the beginning. And that the Lord God and His Spirit have sent Him. Showing the triune nature of God. That's another verse in the Old Testament uh, where we see the Trinity. I still wanted to prove the Muslims wrong though because... I was believing what the media was telling me. I was brainwashed by the media. The media says that the Muslims worship a black rock. They worship the prophet. They worship the moon. They do all these kinds of evil things. They oppress the weak. They are cruel to them. They are cruel to old people. They are cruel to women. This is what the media is teaching. They are even cruel to each other, their own brothers. This is what the media is teaching, and I was believing it. So I went to the mosque and I wanted to buy a Quran, a translation of a Quran. And so I went there and they gave it to me for free. And I had some questions, so I asked him a few questions. But then I went home and I started studying very, very hard. I'd study for hours and hours to try and find mistakes in the Quran and find problems with their religion. But I wasn't able to find any. Any problems I found were easily explained. And the Okay, I can give a few contradictions uh, in the Quran. Historical errors. Um, Muhammad confused Mary, the mother of Jesus, with Mary, the sister of Aaron. And I'll put the references up where you can see Mary, the mother of Jesus, being confused with Mary, this, uh, the sister of Aaron. The Quran in Surah 5 says that Mary was a part of the Trinity. No, no Christian in history believes that Mary is a part of the Trinity. Um, but that's what we see in the Quran. Um, in, in this surah, we see that several angels, plural angels, uh, appear to Mary to reveal to her that she's going to bear her son, uh, you know, the Messiah. And then in this surah, it says that one angel appeared to her, Angel Gabriel. So which one is it? Uh, the timelines are off. And I mean, we, we can make a video, you know, a separate video just on the contradictions and errors, historical and biblical errors in, in the Quran. Uh, Muhammad confused Ishmael for Isaac, saying that Abraham w w was sacrificing Ishmael. Uh, but the Bible says it was Isaac. Uh, e even if there was no contradictions in the Quran, it's still false uh, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but l let's finish the video. First thing that I wanted to know about this prophet of Islam was he rich or was he poor? Because I thought that maybe he was only doing it for money. So I thought, okay, is he rich or was he poor? And I found out that he was wealthy first and then he became poor after he began to deliver the message. And even after he began to deliver the message, they came and offered him money, but he refused it. So after I read the Quran, I knew that if there was any message from my Lord, that this was the message. And so I went to the Imam and I took the Shahada. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu an Muhammadin Rasulallah. And one of the greatest gifts that you have is that you are born into this religion of Islam. So do not turn your backs on it like the Christians have turned their backs on their religion. If only they would follow their book, they would be similar to the Muslims. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.
Okay, well, there it is, guys. That's my thoughts uh, and my reaction. I mean, it's kind of sad. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't see or hear one solid argument that convinced me why he left. Well, he, he was never Christian to, to begin with, uh, based on his understanding of the Bible, the scriptures, taking little things out of context. And Anyway. Uh, but anyway, if I, if I see that you guys, uh, you know, like this video and that if I see that you guys uh, want more of these, then I might make it a series and make more uh, reaction videos to similar videos like this where, where ex-Christians have left Christianity for Islam. But uh, yeah, thanks guys for watching and uh, take care.